Hi, I'm Jim Pettit, and this is my story. I'll take you back to uh, February 10th of 2001, just before 8.30 in the morning. It is a Saturday morning, and it's another day at work for me at the car lot that I work at in Burlington, Ontario. It is the Saturn store. I have driven from Hamilton down the highway, picked up my uh, Tim Hortons coffee and my donut, and I'm smoking a cigarette. I pull into the uh, parking lot in Burlington, which is just across from the store I actually work at, and I put that last cigarette out, finish up my uh, apple fritter, and, uh, and with coffee in hand, I walk across the street. It's a fine day. It's very cold. It's the middle of the winter. It doesn't get much colder. I'm wearing a very, very warm parka. Everything's normal as far as I'm concerned. And I cross the street, get into the door, and I take my big parka off, which is normal. There's a closet right at the front door. So as I'm taking it off, I feel a little bit funny. A strange feeling comes over me. I don't know what it is, but I know I have to sit down. So I put the jacket away, and I sit at the closest seat that I can, which is the receptionist chair right at the front door. As I sit down there and I put my hands on the table, I become a statue. And when I say I become a statue, I really became a statue, frozen in time. Nothing worked on me from being mobile, operating, ready for work, another day of car sales, to I can't even move my eyeballs. I'm staring ahead. There's a couple of people at that front desk, and they're having uh, a, a discussion, and they include me in that discussion and ask me a question. And of course, I wanted to answer, and I'm sort of staring past them, but I can't. There is no words coming out of my mouth. There is no thoughts coming out of my head. All I can do is stare ahead. I want to answer, but there are no words. They suddenly realize something's wrong with Jim. And after thinking, well, oh, Jim's kidding. Oh, no, Jim's not kidding. They realize I'm in trouble. They lay me down on the floor and call 911. Well, this is an event that I didn't want to happen. And I'll give you a background on that. My father had a stroke at the age of 47. And I was 16 years old at the time, and it was devastating for me. Within six months, I had to see a, a doctor, a dot on pills to calm me down. I felt the, the world and all of its weight were on my shoulders. And uh, I guess we called it white... Back then, we called that a nervous breakdown. Uh, it was a crisis. We worked through that. took about a year and a half. And I was in school at the time from grade 11 to grade 12. And I got through that. I learned a lot from it. But the one thing I didn't want to have was my father's stroke. I watched a man that was vital go from vital to what I used to call him my weird brother because he only had a few words that he could uh, use on a daily basis. And, of course, the stroke had an aftermath where his right arm didn't work, his right leg didn't work properly without a brace, and uh, he was never able to work again. So I didn't want that in my future. And to ensure that didn't happen to me, four years from before my stroke, I went up to my family doctor and said, oh, the worst thing in the world that could happen to me is having a stroke, and I don't want it. So can you do all the tests in the world and make sure that I'm not going to have a stroke? And I was told and assured, no problem at all, we'll run all the tests. And they ran all the tests, and the doctor said, you're fine. So I didn't do anything because I had got no advice on what should I be doing to prevent having a stroke. I didn't even know the signs of a stroke, really. So I went on, and it ended up that day that I had my stroke. This was the worst fear I could imagine, and it was happening at that very moment. The depression, the shock 
was unbelievable. So they rushed me to the hospital. Fortunately, the hospital uh, they rushed me to had something that most hospitals at that time did not have. That was a clot-busting drug called TPA. Well, they determined that I was a candidate for that, and uh, after they did the test to determine that, they gave it to me, and amazingly enough, within an hour, I was responding to the treatment. I was actually sitting up. Friends and family had come in, and I was actually able to talk to them. Now, it was halted speech, but I was fully aware, and I could actually respond to them, which I couldn't do when I had that stroke. Well, that was great until a few hours later. And a few hours later, I had another stroke. This was even worse because I felt it coming on and there was nothing I could do about it. It slowly drained everything from my body. The ability to use the left-hand side of my body was slowly melting away from me. The ability to communicate verbally at first was going away. Then the, to communicate uh, by writing things down was slowly going away as words just disappeared from the page, so to speak, in my mind. And the alphabet started to disappear from my head till ABC meant absolutely nothing to me. By midnight of that night, my best friend tracked down the doctor who admitted me and got him to give him an overview of what should we expect out of Jim over the next 24 hours, 48 hours, over the next week. And the doctor looked at him and said, I don't expect him to live overnight. Fortunately, my friend didn't tell me about that, or that would have really ruined my day. As it was, uh, I was left alone at one point. People went home, and all I had was a, a pencil and a little piece of paper that I'd been writing on before, and I was losing the ability to do that. And the last thing I ever wrote down on that, till much later, was one word, four letters in a little tiny scrawl. And it said, help. <laughs>